It's Monday, December 12th, and this is Geek Nights. Tonight we talk about how to purchase a computer without getting ripped off or buying more than you need. Let's, Let's do, do this. this. So I uh, heard something happened to you on the way to work on the train. Yeah, train hit a deer. Uh, who won? Train. Yeah, I figured. Deer didn't, uh, you know, entirely lose, though. The train broke. Like, <laughs> they were like, yeah, the air's leaking out of the brake pipe. Yeah, so we're going to stop the train like three times. Now, I could have gotten off at 125th, but I didn't know it was broken. And then we went in the tunnel, and then the train stopped. Great. You can't get off in the tunnel because you'll uh, die. And then we waited in there, and I was like a half hour, 15 minutes. I was late. It sucked. I sat on the train with these annoying people. <laughs> Too bad. You could have just taken the four, five, six. At least for the first time in about a month, I am uh, well rested and ready to go. Uh, I was also very well rested today. And we even a- though it's a Monday, which means I had to go to work, work was quick. It's like yeah, I Mondays came, are great. And I left. I was sitting down in the data center doing work, and suddenly I look up, and it's like 4 o'clock. I think it's partially because on Monday there's a whole lot of brand new podcast episodes. And yeah. Also a whole, a whole of bunch new, of uh, web comics. A whole bunch of web comics, and internet news, and everything. Plus, while we had a crazy geek end, and we played a bunch of board games, which we'll get to tomorrow, and uh, did a bunch of stuff, we actually got to sleep early. Ah, uh, sleep because those people left early. Yeah, everyone left early. Although you of... know, honestly, I would have rather had them stay to play more games. Yeah, I wanted to play another round of a uh, Verator. Verator. Verator's freaking awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. Though there's some uh, pretty big news, at least for anime fans. Media Play is going out of business. Yay! That means I can go get a clearance sale. Yeah. Yeah, we're totally looting the nearest Media Play. Thank God there is one nearby. Which I guess we should have seen it coming, because, I mean, when we lived in Rochester, Media Play was, like, huge, and that's where all the anime was, and it was great. It's because it was the closest thing to the Yeah, to the and that Media Play realized this and catered to it. Mm-hmm. Now, we moved here, and, you know, years later, and our Media Play here is really kind of shitty. Yeah, the Media Play here is definitely, like, a crap hole. No one goes there. I mean, it was sparse. It's and... in the low-rent mall. Yeah. They never had things on time. Yeah. Had the same busted drum nobody, set sitting there on display. There was nobody in it. Yeah, definitely not the peak of media play. Well, apparently, the anime and manga is really the only thing propping media play up at all. Well, they they always kept so many CDs in that store. I was like, why do they well, even have a CD section? You want to know why? Toss it. The people who own media play, who started that company back in 1995 or 96, it wasn't that long ago. They were primarily record sellers and CD sellers. Good job. And their business model actually was CD store that also sells other media. That's a great idea. It should have been other media store. Well, that worked real well, you know, for about a year. And then, you know, Napster, uh, MP3s. Yeah, it's just hard to compete. For them, with these other stores, like well, they can't Best compete with Buy bookstores because bookstores have all the books and they don't have so many. Yeah, that's the problem. Media Play should have just gotten rid of its book section because it was really never really worth anything, and they should have just be gone all out with the DVDs. Because like Walmart and Best Buy sell the most DVDs and stuff, but Media Play, you know, really had the good DVD section because they had the box sets. Yeah, but they spent all their money. Like they had a video game section that wasn't as good as GameStop, a book section that wasn't as good as Borders, you know, uh, a CD section that wasn't <laughs> good. CDs. Right? But they had the best DVD section, better than any other store. They should have just turned into a DVD store. I think their problem though was that their stores are real big. Too big to be just a DVD store. Yeah, because even so. the small media play, because, you know, every box store like that has different sizes. It was real big. Yeah. Not like FYE. They have, like, one version that's real tiny and fits in a mall. Yep. That's the problem with being in a, a diverse uh, products is that, you know, you, you have so much, like, space and other things, you can't really give up or on, on too many of them if, you know. If one of them fails, that's all right, but... If all of them fail but one, you're screwed. Yeah. Though I hear FYE isn't doing so well either. Yeah, FYE, because that's the same kind of thing, is they diversify. Yeah. And they do sell mostly CDs at FYE. Though actually, the FYE, back when I lived in Michigan, that opened up, it uh, had an arcade in it. Yeah, so did mine in my mall. Yeah, and then the arcade disappeared. No, we still have the arcade in ours. Ah. In fact, it's the only arcade for many, many miles. <laughs> but they, the, C, the store is mostly a music store, although the DVD section expanded a whole lot, and the video game section kind of shrunk it back there. 
But that video game section is actually useful because it's like the last place people look in the mall to buy video games. And they always carry games that like are kind of a little bit off. So when you can't get a game, they always have it. So I yep, always go yep. look there. So they're ma- still, still making money. But I wonder if this is going to affect the uh, anime DVD trade, at least for a little while. I mean, media play in a lot of areas is the major uh, seller of anime-related goods. Yeah, that's because they had the nice anime section. But um, I don't know. Best Buy does have the anime DVDs. and uh, Yeah, but, I mean, really, they're overpriced, and they don't have the new anime. They do have the new anime, actually. These... Not the day it comes out. They're always behind. No, not the day it comes out. I don't know. I wonder what the uh, anime companies think of media play. Like, what? Because I know... Like, they're usually into, like, the Suncoast type of thing. Like, the Suncoast always has the anime. That's the place. Yeah. You know, but Suncoast is media play. Is all of is it just media play or all the media play-related stores? Because I know that back in the day when I still ran the RIT Anime Club, we, that we started working with the media play, and they were all about that. They'd give us just hundreds of dollars of free stuff to give away to draw people into the store to buy anime. Yeah, I think that media play is actually profitable, and that like they should just close the other ones and leave that one open. Yeah, they should, but I heard from... Uh, actually, we got some friends who run a, a Hammer Girls, this anime store right there in Rochester, like across the street from media play. Mm-hmm. They're going to go loot media play for all its stuff when they go uh, liquidating in January. Yep, and then sell it in their own store. Yeah, which is going to work for them. They're pretty much going to have a monopoly on everything except manga that's related to anime now. Yep. Because Walden Books, honestly, is making a killing on manga. Yeah, it's, the anime store here doesn't sell... Uh, no, they sell, like, dealer room stuff here. Yeah, it's like going to a dealer's room. It's not, you know, you can't get the pro stuff. There really isn't now... I don't think there's going to be a reliable place to buy all the pro things in our town anymore. And I'm, I haven't gone without that for a long time. Yeah, but the more I think about it, one, a lot of shows I really like, but I don't want to buy, but I want to see them. And now that we have Netflix, I mean... Yeah, Netflix killed a lot of it, but I also... There's a lot of shows we're not going to buy now. But expect Amazon to start selling a lot more anime DVDs. Yep. Or actually, buying direct from ADV, they have some damn good sales every now and then. That's only their old stuff on clearance. Yeah, but if you you want old stuff stuff... on clearance, that's the Scott Johnson strategy. Yeah, but you're better off. You get a better deal at the con sometimes. It depends. But don't buy anything from ADV or rights. Don't buy from rights stuff ever, really. Yeah. Right Stuff is like, they have everything there is, so if there's nowhere else to get it, get it from Right Stuff, but they sell everything at like the real price, except if it's like a cold day in hell. Yeah. They'll change the price or sell something on sale. Though I gotta say, you're not gonna hear much about this until January when they actually close, and I imagine we're gonna have a podcast dedicated to the hundreds and hundreds of dollars of DVDs we bought. Yeah, I'll have to go see, try to get the best deal. You know, maybe I'll pick up. I know they have good stuff there, and I'm pretty confident that no one in this town is going to pick it up. <laughs> so I'm going to go get, like, you know, all those box sets I wanted. Like, I'll pick up all the FMAs they've got. Yeah, I'll get all the Gonkutsuo they got. Get, like, the Azamanga Dial box set. Yeah, right. Captain Tyler, my favorite show. I still don't own it. Yeah, we'll go clean it out, and then we'll fill in the holes from Amazon or something later. We'll have to buy another DVD rack. Yeah, maybe there'll be one on clearance. (laughs) All right. So the Xbox 360. Didn't sell so well in Japan. Nope. Well, on Kotaku, the the guy's in Japan, so he pretty much covered the whole thing. He went around Japan to all these stores on the launch day, and they were taking pictures of everything. And, you know, they showed this one kind of... uh, It wasn't even a store you can enter. It was in Osaka... And it was just one of those stores that faces the street. You know, it's just like the wall of a building, and there's you buy stuff. And there was a little tiny, tiny line of, like, two guys and a whole bunch of Xbox 360s, and yeah. And uh, he showed the scene from, like, the huge store in Tokyo. And there was a line of about 100 guys, you know. A nice, respectable, normal line. The kind of line you saw when the Game Boy Advance came out, maybe. You know. But, uh... Didn't sell out. No, nah, no, nah, not. Nah. Actually, if I were in Japan, I'd buy two or three and sell them on eBay back to the U.S. Yep. Apparently, the only difference, according to these people, is that the remote control has Japanese characters on it. Huh. And the, I think the default language is Japanese. I don't know about any region coding, though. We still have to find that out. Yeah. But Though, real- honestly, I'll bet for fanboys, having the Japanese remote would be a status symbol. It would be. There's also this rumor that they're selling, they've already lowered the price to about 150 bucks 
With uh, wait, a hundred and fifty bucks in the equivalent yen, but you have to get an ISP contract. That's fine. One hundred and fifty bucks. Are you serious? And a, and a contract with the Japanese ISP. I'll pay that. They can't. They won't be able to sue me. I'll say I'll I'll take the contract, then I'll just stop paying and keep the Xbox. Hmm. Yeah. What the hell? Maybe you could pull it off. We, you know how easy that would be to refute when your credit card. You go to the credit card company and say, "Why would I pay for a Japanese ISP? I don't live in Japan. It's obviously identity theft." I guess, but you could get in trouble if they find out. It's real hard to prosecute anything like that over national boundaries. Maybe. Not that I'm officially advocating anyone try that, but uh, yeah, I'm definitely thinking. I mean, I know some. There were some guys who were podcasting. They were just in Japan. I don't know why they didn't take advantage of this. You know, just pick up some Xbox 360s. Oh, maybe they you would they wouldn't let you take them on the plane or ship them or any. It might be tough. Oh, you'd have to ship them to yourself as a gift. Yeah, it's tricky. But that's tough because then you can't get a lot of insurance on it. So if it gets borked or destroyed, you're kind of screwed. Yeah, you'd have to get like buy like ten of them and send them all separately. And because when I li- actually, just because Michigan happens to be relevant again, we lived in Michigan. You couldn't bring a lot of stuff over the border, and there was a big business in, in shipping companies that would ship things over the border kind of surreptitiously. You know, things like liquor and cigarettes and all that sort of tax type stuff. So apparently. Uh, I thought that the leading cause of liver failure was drunkenness. I figured it was hepatitis. Yeah, hepatitis due to drunkenness. Uh, most hepatitis is not caused by drunkenness, but anyway. Well, actually, m- pretty much any liver disease is hepatitis, isn't it? Yeah, there are many different kinds of hepatitis. And there right. are also liver diseases that are not hepatitis. Anyway, well, the leading cause of acute liver failure is... Let me guess, let me guess. Tylenol? It's Tylenol. Well, oh, yeah. actually, it's acetaminophen. Which, Which is, is Tylenol. Yeah, but it's also in other things like NyQuil, NyQuil and such. It's in almost every uh, like cold, syrupy mm-hmm. stuff you drink. Yep. The number of cases doubled between 98 and 2003. Now, this guy, who is not a doctor or anything, he's just a blogger or whatever. Great. But he says he noticed something smart. Uh, over the last several years, regular strength Tylenol, which is 325 milligrams has been disappearing in favor of extra strength, 500 milligram Tylenol. And he wonders, huh, maybe the the liver disease doubled because the Tylenol strength is increasing. Huh. I remember Jerry Seinfeld in his stand-up did a bit about that. It was like, extra strength? Yeah, it's just the same thing as before, but more. Yeah. Maximum strength? Just take uh, the maximum possible human dose. One more drop would kill me. Back it off a little well, bit. It takes it, it takes four thousand milligrams to uh, kill you in a day. So you can take eight extra strength Tylenols in a day, and then you'll be on the edge. See, I personally generally always avoided Tylenol because I was very acutely aware from when I was young, and my, I took some Tylenol. My doctor always said, "Don't take too much; it causes liver damage. Yep. You're better off taking aspirin." I avoid drugs in general. Well, see, it's it's weird. I mean, Tylenol was billed when it first appeared, or acetaminophen, as a safer painkiller. Because aspirin, the the side effects of aspirin come right out. Oh, an ulcer. Oh, my stomach. Oh, that, that uh, Ray's syndrome, or Rye syndrome that kids can get. Yep, that's really all aspirin can do to you is fuck up your stomach. Or if you take a whole bunch, it'll kill you. Well, of course. You take a whole bunch of any drug, it'll kill you. You can take a whole bunch of freaking children's Tylenol, it'll kill you. But Tylenol, all the side effects are hidden. You're not gonna, your liver is not going to go, ow, my liver, suddenly. Yeah, but seriously, to uh, get acute liver failure from Tylenol, you really need to be taking too much Tylenol. Or take a lot of it, take a normal amount too often yeah. over a long period I'm of time. I'm pretty sure that most of these people dying of acute liver failure on Tylenol are the kind of people who are just like, oh, something hurts Tylenol. Oh, something hurts Tylenol. Yep. And they're just taking it daily, multiple times a week, all over also, the place. Also, if you happen to drink in addition, that's just a double whammy on the liver right there. Oh, yeah. If you freaking drink with Tylenol, like, oh, I think I'll put some Tylenol in some beer and drink it. You're just killing That's like killing Well, you yourself. know what probably leaves a lot of that? Let's see. Drink all night, wake up in the morning, hey, I got a hangover. Tylenol. See, I'm smart. I get a hangover, aspirin. Or actually, you know what? Multivitamin and orange juice, and then I go back to bed. Uh, you know what? I just don't get drunk, and then I don't take Tylenol. Yeah, I- we'll, I see. The wind. we'll see what, how you do when I, I open up that Pusser's Rum. 
<laughs> we'll see. I'm yeah, not going to drink yeah, this it. This is I'm... definitely an aside, but I got a hold of, just randomly on a whim, this is definitely an impulse buy, Pusser's Rum, which apparently is the same rum that they used on the sailing ships of Britain back in the Horatio Nelson slash Hornblower days. Arr. And uh, got a recipe for grog. And I'm going to make grog because I'm curious what it tastes like. And I'm going to give you all an update as to whether or not it tastes like ass. I'm not going to drink it as per my not drinking rule, but I'll like put my tongue in it just to see what it tastes like so I know what pirates were drinking. You got to at least swish it around in your mouth. Then you can spit it into a bucket like wine testers do. I'll probably just drink like a teaspoon of it so it doesn't do anything. Though I got to say, I got some sad commentary for Americans. We went to the wine store the other day, and we were, you know, looking at wine, and they had a, bu- a, b- a table where they had a bunch of bottles of port, and they had samples, and you could try the port, and I tried one, I actually ended up buying a couple bottles, well, one bottle, but they had the bucket out, and I don't think anyone else there, other than the guy giving the samples and me, knew what the bucket was for, because I went and I spit in the bucket, because you're supposed to taste the wine and then spit it out so you don't get drunk. And I spit in the bucket. I was the only person to have ever spit in that bucket, as far as I could tell. And there were a lot of people sampling the wine. Why? Why? Why didn't they put a little thing on it? Like, don't they know, being a liquor store that's been open for how long, that no one ever spits in the bucket? Wouldn't it be hilarious if it wasn't actually a spit bucket and it was like something else, and you spit in it? <laughs> I mean, you looked in. There was no spit in there, right? Yeah. Wouldn't it be hilarious if it was just a bucket? Like he was going to put ice in it or something and then put a bottle in there, but no, you spit in it. But while we're on the topic of uh, Tylenol and disease and all that, and since it's Monday, which theoretically is Science Day a little, there's some interesting evidence that some forms of childhood cancer may not be caused by environmental factors so much as by pathogens. Which pathogen? Uh, Maybe the common cold. They're not sure. This is currently the best this research can be called is a statistical anomaly. But basically, they did a study where they looked at a lot of cases of childhood cancer in a bunch of regions in London or in Britain, somewhere in Britain. And they noticed something odd. Apparently, when a disease breaks out, the disease spreads in certain ways that you can analyze statistically and you can say like, wow, this was a disease because look, it spread in clusters in this type of way, in this time, this place, whatever. Mm -hmm. And diseases or illnesses that are caused by environmental factors like poisons or pollution or carcinogens tend to cluster in the same area over a long period of time. They cluster a different way. Mm -hmm. And you can see these patterns in the long term by looking at who got what disease when and where. And the data coming back from the study, which they they were studying something completely different, but they discovered that the cancer in childhood seems to be clustering, and this is 8% above what was expected statistically, in space-time as opposed to in space. So it's, it's happening in areas at a certain time in a cluster and then disappearing instead of happening in one area repeatedly, hmm. which would lend one to believe that these cancers are being caused by some sort of pathogen more likely than some sort of environmental factor. Hmm. This is very preliminary uh, evidence, but there's it's a statistical anomaly, and they're looking into it, and the most obvious culprit they seem to believe is the common cold. Well, the common cold is a virus, right? Yes. So don't uh, bash my rudimentary biological knowledge, but a virus goes in a cell, right? It makes mischief. Yep. And then the cell explodes, and a bunch of viruses come out, and they go for more cells, right? That's yep, it the, alters... Well, some viruses alter the cell's DNA. Some use their RNA to... The retroviruses use right, their right, RNA. Right, right, right. That sort of thing. And those sorts of things, as in destroying cells and modifying cells, would be the kind of thing to cause cancer, would it not? Possibly. One thing that so they're So it does make a little sense. They're suggesting that possibly it's a common illness coupled with some sort of genetic predisposition, and the two together, cancer. Ah, so if your DNA was such and such, and you got the common cold, the common cold would normally modify someone's DNA to make some common coldness. But if you have DNA that's messed up, and the common cold comes in there, it makes a cancer. That's one of the theories. It also has a nice blurb at the end about how it's important for kids to be exposed to diseases, but at the right times, and... All this sorts of cool stuff. I'd like huh. to see the real study, but I don't have access to that sort of medical If it's journal. true, then maybe the common cold plus cancer could be some sort of arbitrary Darwinian push. Possibly. Against certain DNA. 
Except that there's actually a fairly good track record of treating many forms of childhood cancer. Yeah. Which is a good thing. It's a lot easier than treating some old guy who's got, like, a stomach full of cancer. Well, in some ways. I mean, sure, children are more resilient, but at the same time, children aren't as mature emotionally to handle that. Imagine being five and a guy in a white suit sticks a needle in your arm and says, You've got cancer. Your life's going to suck for the next three years. Yeah, but I mean, uh, you know, emotional troubles you might not be able to cure, but it, you can at least cure the physical things easier. Yeah. I mean, like, it seems like everywhere I look, I mean, this isn't statistical or scientific at all. But all right, anecdotal here. Here we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. I see a lot of old people who die of cancer, and I see a lot of young people who survived it. Yeah. I'm not, I mean, mm. I'm not saying the emotional fact. I mean, it's just more of a... It's harder to help a child deal with something like that emotionally. Oh, yeah. And that's why I didn't expect to, but big plug here, Child's Play. Mm -hmm. Penny Arcade runs a charity, you probably all know it since you're all geeks and you listen to our show, where you donate money to Child's Play, or you donate video games or games. Or you just go to their Amazon list and buy something. Yeah. And they distribute these goods to children with cancer and children in hospital and children who have nothing else to do because they're on chemotherapy, things like that. Mm Mm-hmm. And... While we tell you to be leery of certain charities because they waste the money, Child's Play doesn't waste the money. It's a it's the only hundred percent safe charity I know. Yep, they even show pictures of here's the giant pile of things we're about to distribute. Yeah, the first year they had that pile that was too too big. Yeah, this is the third year I think, isn't it? It is. Wow. And every year it's grown just gangbusters. Yep. You know, I never really went to the hospital because I'm too healthy. Actually, I did. I had a very dangerous flu, and I was hospitalized for a slightly significant part of my early childhood. Was, but anyway, when I went to the orthodontist and it was going to hurt, that Game Boy was freaking awesome, let me tell you. <laughs> Played some Zelda or some Metroid 2, and oh yeah, that was, that was the greatest. So I imagine if I had um, cancer or a broken leg, that uh, nice GBA, that'd be freaking great. Yeah, yeah. And without it, it would freaking suck. Especially for kids who their parents can't really get them anything because they're paying all the medical bills. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and I know there are children's hospitals out there that, you know, don't have the video games, but Child's Play is definitely cutting that number way down. Yes, and anything that impro- that increases the number of video games out there is just a win for me. Mm-hmm. And a win for kids with cancer. So what you got, Schmo? How do you like our new uh, Thing of the Day music? I don't know, because uh, we added in later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's like finding I heard out... part of it, but I didn't hear the final product. I'll tell yeah. you tomorrow. That's like finding out that the late shows you like are recorded during the day. They are. That's ours why, is, that's why actually... they're not sleeping during theirs, and we are. Yeah. Ours is actually recorded at night. We're Geek Nights. See, the reason it's Geek Nights is because we started recording it at night and doing it the next day. And then we decided, screw that, we'll just put it out at night after we finish it. Yeah, like at midnight, 1 a.m., whenever yep. we put it out. But anyway, my thing of the day, I, I, I'm really not sure how I found this. I think someone just linked me to it at work, and I, I stumbled upon it somehow. But basically, it's just this site where people keep uploading cute pictures, and it's kind of like your daily shot in the arm of cute things. I don't need that. I, I like stuff like that. They have a little plushy uh, flu virus. I've seen that before. A little sugar glider flying through someone's house. I didn't even know what that animal was until I saw that picture. Yeah, flying squirrel. Really cute. Really friendly. Big eyes. Fluffy. Yeah. Like, Where the hell do they sell those? Uh, exotic pet shops. They're actually not that uncommon of the a pet. The swingingest pet shop in town. <laughs> actually, I had a friend in high school who had a sugar glider. Oh. She also had a baby fox, and it was probably the cutest animal I've ever played with. Well, when it got older, didn't it turn into a nasty evil fox? Actually, it's really sad. It got crushed by a board. A board? A giant piece of wood fell over in their basement and crushed it one day. What was it doing in the basement? It was just down there. They didn't think the board would fall over. It It was doing evil fox things. Foxes aren't evil. Yeah, they're harassing people anyway. They're not harassing people. They're hungry and they see a chicken and they kill the chicken and eat it. Yeah, it's great for the chicken farmer. (laughs) Damn foxes. Fox isn't useful to people. Chicken is. Anyway. So is that all you got? Yeah, yeah, that's all I got. A cute thing. Yeah, I'm sure when people look at the cute pictures, they'll get more out of it. So um, there's a, a thing some guy wrote on Craigslist. It's pretty old. It's from March 2004. But I just found it. I'm a little late to the party. Well, uh, you know, there's this thing called the Internet. Yeah, it's a very, you know, it wasn't b- 
big on the internet. Maybe in some areas, but in, not in my field of vision. But you know, you're, you'd better pray that I haven't already seen what you're about to talk about. I'm praying. All right. Anyway, it's called "Hey Crackhead," and this guy wrote this little kind of essay letter to these crackheads. Now. The thing is, is the guy was, I think he was hanging with his girlfriend in the city or something like that, and he had a motorcycle. And one day he came outside in the motorcycle, the spark plugs were sawed off. What? The spark plugs of his motorcycle were sawed off. What kind of a jerk would you have to be to saw off the spark plugs of some dude's motorcycle? And he's like, what the hell? He's like, all right. So he freaking, you know takes it to the you know the shop and he gets everything fixed and he had to pay a ticket for leaving it on the street that night and everything and it, it sucked. <laughs> so he finally got it fixed and when he got there the guy told him um you know that crackheads cut spark plugs off of bikes to use them as crack pipes. Um I submit to you that you can buy a top the line spark plug for about a dollar. Yeah, okay. So this guy ended up paying $100 to fix his, his bike at the shop. Uh, and he says, but re then re I remember that I just paid $100 for your crack pipes. <laughs> dot, 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 you know. <laughs> There's so many choice lines, I can't read the whole thing. You're just going to have to visit it. But, um, you know, so he bought a few extra spark plugs. And he, like, taped them to his bike. So he's like, here, you want crack pipes? Here they are. <laughs> right? But again, they screwed up his bike and cut off one of the spark plugs. And he had tools, and he had extra spark plugs, and he was ready for it, right? But he didn't have the right size ratchet, and he didn't have the right size thing. So he had to go to the store and get a different ratchet and everything, and he's pissed off again, right? And he says, and he says, all right, I'm rambling, but the point is, crackhead, that you've done me wrong. Now, I get that you love crack. That is totally understandable. I've heard it's really fun at first, and quite addictive. What I don't understand is... You are, this is all caps, this last sentence. You are a crackhead. Why don't you own a crack pipe? <laughs> you I, know what? They probably keep losing it. I'm an engineer. Do you ever see me shaking down bums in the loin for a calculator and slide rule? No, you don't, because engineering is the main thing I do. I went and bought myself a calculator. The main thing you do is crack. How do you get by without a crack pipe? <laughs> the other... <laughs> The See, other crackheads must clown you nonstop. I mean, the fucking saw you used to saw off my spark plugs is probably worth five or ten bucks. Why not sell or trade it for a crack pipe? <laughs> you haven't put much thought into this, have you? <laughs> and then he just goes, there's stuff before that and after that, but he basically, it's this open letter to the damn crackheads, like, God damn it, leave my bike alone, you fucking crackheads. <laughs> <laughs> it's just hilarious, and it, it's so well written. All right, I, I'll admit that I have not not seen this and i'm gonna read it after i uh finish the show yeah i, I, I guarantee hysterical laughter <laughs> all right so we don't have music for our crack bit yet. <laughs> yeah great ice capades <laughs> yeah inside joke anyway so uh well this we were inspired to do this because of one of our friends this weekend yeah genius he's a smart guy we, we like him a lot he's a good friend he likes the board games the video games yep and he likes the PCs. Everyone likes the PCs. I mean, it's the number one tool. And he wants to buy a new PC. Definitely needs one. Can't, can't agree more. And we've realized that a lot of people, even really geeky people, grossly over or underestimate what they actually need a PC for. Yep. So uh, today's show is how to buy a goddamn computer. Or how to at least choose a computer. How to not get ripped off. Yeah, don't buy more than you need, don't buy less than you need, don't spend more than you need. Yeah. Oh, and make don't buy something that's going to fall apart. And just so you know, we uh, take our own medicine. Scott has a pretty fancy fast computer because yep. he replaced the oldest, most decrepit computer we had. My it's, computer is now the oldest and most decrepit computer Yeah, my had. previous computer is the shittiest computer in the house. And I have not upgraded my computer because it's fast enough to do the podcast and I don't need it for anything else. Yep. So anyway, our friend... He's like, yeah, I need a new computer, right? And I'm like, all right, well, you should probably get a Mac Mini, because I knew what he needed, right? Yeah, he surfs and the I, web. 
And I knew that he wasn't so good with putting computers together. Cause no one, offense. Because once he did hold a stick of RAM and walk across a carpet while wearing a sweater and wool socks. <laughs> God, I forgot about that. Yes. So I was like, you should get a Mac Mini. That's all. That would be perfect for you because you wouldn't worry about the Steve spywares. You'd have your web. You'd have your email. You'd have your IM. You'd have everything you need. It would be cute. It would be powerful. It would look good. You'd be happy, right? Now, he was kind of wary of this because he wanted to play the games, right? And I'm like, all right, what games are you going to play? You haven't played a PC game in two years. The most games that he, I could see him playing was Half-Life 2, which is understandable with the whole Steam. That's the only thing I keep Windows for. Yep. And maybe a couple MMOs if he decided to get into them, right? Now, okay, that would, those three games would cost him maybe about $150 in two monthly fees at most, right? But the difference between a computer that could run those games and a computer that would do everything else he needed except run those games would be about $800. Okay, I guess if those games are worth $950 plus... You know what? For $950, you can buy an Xbox and a pile of games. Yeah, and this guy... Now, that would be all right, you know, for just about anyone, except for that 10 minutes earlier, he was complaining that he couldn't get Paper Mario because it was... Still, 35 bucks at the store, that was too rich for him. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, you can't buy Paper Mario, which is awesome and is 30 hours of fun for 35 bucks, but you can pay $950 extra dollars for a computer to play three lousy games versus the $400 computer that'll do everything else you need better than you need it to do. So I guess the first rule is, if you're going to buy a computer and you really need one or you're serious about getting one, sit down and just write down or use your computer. Just sit at the computer you have now. Use it for a while and write down every program you run in the course of an hour. That's I guarantee right. the list is going to be a lot smaller than you think it will be. I mean, I have quite a few programs on my computer, but all I really use is Firefox, email, AIM, media playing, SSH, text editing, maybe word processing, maybe, maybe, maybe spreadsheet or money keeping track of. And you, some of those things I could do on the web. You can buy a computer for about $100 that'll do all that adequately. Hell, an Apple IIGS from 1986 will do all that if you upgrade it and you're mad lead. Yeah, but if you're not mad lead, spend a couple hundred bucks and get a real computer. Just get a normal, normal computer. will do all of those things just fine. A normal, normal computer will do all of those things better than you can possibly need. Now, also, there's the, there's the level of computer you need. So once you pick, like, I'm, gonna get, I'm not going to get a Mac Mini, I'm going to get a PC. I want a PC because I want to play games. Think about what games you want to play, because a crap old computer will play everything up to and including Counter-Strike Natural Selection, the previous generation of FPSs, perfectly. Hell, if you get, nowadays, you can get a GeForce 4 and, like, a, a pile of RAM and all kinds of stuff for still really freaking cheap. You only have to pay out the ass if you want top-of-the-line stuff. I mean, consider this. My current computer can play any Half-Life 1-based Steam game. So, Counter-Strike, Natural Selection, Ricochet, uh, all the Battlefield whatever, all those games. Yep. My computer is a 1 gigahertz Thunderbird, 512 megabytes of old-style PC2100 DDR RAM, mm -hmm. and a GeForce 2. Yep. So, if you get a new computer right now with an Athlon XP or a low-end, uh, maybe a Sempron or the, the crummiest AMD 64, 512 megs of nice DDR RAM, a GeForce 4. Uh, a cheap GeForce 4, not the top of the line or, one. Yeah, the built-in built one might not do it if you really want to play a game, but it'll do it for anything but games. It'll guaranteed. do it for any game but Half-Life 2. Well, no, you can actually play Half-Life 2 if you have a real GeForce 4. It just won't be the greatest Half-Life 2 experience. You'll have to turn the graphics down a little bit. You yeah, know? which isn't acceptable for me, but your taste may differ. Yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're not going to be playing Half-Life 2 hardcore in competitions or going to mad LAN parties, a, a good GeForce 4 or maybe a lower-numbered GeForce FX... Will totally pull you through. You'll be you'll be just fine. I mean, do you need to play Half Life Two right now? Yeah. I mean, you can play it right now for an extra five hundred dollars on top of what you're gonna buy anyway, or you can wait a year, buy a four hundred dollar computer that'll play Half Life Two perfectly, and you won't be able to play the next generation game, which is fine because you yeah. never played Half Life Two. The expensive, the really really expensive computers, the that the 
the the greater than one thousand dollar computers only really make sense if you are hardcore playing a whole bunch of PC games all the time. Yeah, if PC gaming is your thing, by all means, splurge. Yeah. Unless you're a hardcore gamer, always buy the the one generation back of everything. You'll save so much money. Oh my god. Yep. And I mean. I used to be big in the PC gaming, you know, so my current computer, like, I can I can play a lot of PC games on it, but I didn't pay too much for it. I only paid $1,000 in the day. Yeah. You know? I paid about $3,600 for my computer, but that was in the year 2000. Mm-hmm. And that included the 19-inch CRT that I still have to this day, the SCSI card, and the SCSI uh, CD burner. CDRW didn't really exist yet. Yep. So... Anyway, if you want to, if you need a new computer, what you need to do is make a list of the things you're going to do with it. So I went to CompUSA once, and actually there was a smart guy who was he was shopping for a computer like I'd never saw anyone shop for one before. Because usually I go around and I'm like, how fast is it? You know, what's the video card? How much RAM is in there? Because I know I can I know that on that level. This guy he wasn't a computer literate guy like like we are, but he knew the right questions to ask. He was like. Will it burn a CD? Can I plug my video camera into it and make a DVD with it? Ah. He, you know, he, at, he, wa- he knew what he wanted to do with the computer. He wanted a device that did X, Y, and Z. And he said, does this one do X, Y, and Z? I want the cheapest one that does X, Y, and Z reliably and well. And that's what you have to do when you get a computer. Now, that's just the hardware. And while we're very pro-Linux, there, that's another thing to look at. Windows cost money. Mm-hmm. If you don't buy a Dell or a Gateway, Windows costs a lot of money. See, and the other thing is, when even if you buy a Dell, you're still paying for Windows whether you know it or not. However, you're really only paying about 30 bucks for Windows in that case because they pretty much give it to Dell for free. Yeah, but you are still paying for it. But basically, it- you've got to consider. If you build a computer yourself, because there's two different cases here, do you really need Windows? Because... If you don't get Windows, that's $250 of more computer you can buy. Yeah. Also, if you compare, if you look at the Dell, hard, just the hardware alone, and you try to build the equivalent computer, especially if you use an AMD processor, you know, which is just as good as an Intel processor, if not better. It'll and, be less than half the cost. Yeah. And it'll faster. Be, it'll be less than half the cost and faster. And... You know, while Windows is technically only $30 of the Dell computer, what's all that other money? That's the Dell profit. Yep. You can avoid all of that and give the money straight to the people who actually make the parts. The only thing is you either need someone to build it for you, build it yourself. And while building it yourself is not for a complete idiot to do, it is so much easier than anyone will let on. I mean, quite seriously, you open your computer and you see all the connectors are all different sizes and shapes. You can't plug anything in wrong. Nothing will let you plug it in wrong. Yep. If it doesn't fit, flip it around, it'll fit, or you're plugging it into the wrong spot. And if you just try everything on everything, eventually everything's going to be in the right space. Yep, the only trick is knowing that which ones have to be connected, because some of the holes don't have to be connected to anything, and some of them do. Yeah, but, but you've other... got to consider that. I mean, what's it worth to you? Do you? Are you confident that you'll be able to diagnose a problem? If you're really not, and you don't want to worry about it, yeah, get the Dell. It'll be slower, but you'll get their tech support at least for whatever it's worth. Mm-hmm. And it'll probably work as soon as you bring it home and turn it on. Because that's actually, I mean, I always recommend build your own computer, and there are a lot of reasons for that. You'll know what's in it. You'll learn a lot about computers. You'll generally get a good deal. Yeah, all those things. But say, you're, say your parents need a computer, or your little brother going to school needs a computer. Now, normally you say, oh, I'll build it for you. But then there's a problem. They call you when it comes time to do tech support. So the trick is, if you're going to do that, you have to make damn well sure that nothing's going to happen to that computer. Or you tell your parents to buy a Dell and you'd never speak of it again. Yep. So for my parents, I built them a computer. And it worked out pretty well because I threw the Ubuntu on there and they never have a problem. When they had Windows, they kept calling me about spyware and stuff and it, it sucked. But now I, I gave them Ubuntu and I set up everything. Everything they complained about, you know, it doesn't do this, it doesn't do that. I fixed all of those problems and now they don't call me anymore because Ubuntu doesn't break. Yep. And they can't break it because it's not Windows. And look, they're using Linux. These are people who, I mean, I've met his parents. They are not technological people. Not at all. They do not. They don't know what this Linux thing is. But you they know They kind of know now because they've been using it. But you they know actually what? brag to their friends. Really? Yeah. That's kind of cool. Because their friends go, why is your computer different? And they're like, oh, we have Linux. It doesn't <laughs> crash like your computer. Yeah. 
No but viruses. I mean, I mean, I remember they were leery at first, but you know what? There was a button that started a web browser. There was a button that started email. They didn't do much else, and when they really wanted to do something else, they had to either learn how to do it or not do it. Yeah. And then they realized there wasn't much else they That's wanted to do. That's all they use is AIM and Firefox. They don't use anything else at all. They could, If they had an AIM and Firefox machine that had all the, AIM, the Firefox plugins they needed, they would be set. They don't need anything you know else at all. Seriously, you out there, our listeners, really don't use your computer for much. Almost no one does. Because the people who use their computer for something weird already know what they need. Yep, they already have Linux. Yeah, or, or, a, or Mac. An, a Mac. I mean, so if you're a, if you want to do a podcast or something, an Apple is really the best way to go. Yeah, we're using Linux just because we don't have an Apple. Yeah, we seriously considered buying a Mac just to do our, this podcast. When it comes to arts and media and audio and video and graphics, the Mac is where it's at. I mean, if you want to do image editing, there are a lot of ma- there's the GIMP. There's ma- there are mature platforms that'll work in Linux. If you want to do audio, there are fairly mature platforms. There's still no Flash equivalent that works. There's nope. still no Maya that works. Nope. I'm not going to even pretend there is. If you do that stuff, you can't use Linux. This Blender, which a lot of people are using, but it, it does it's not quite the same. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, the only real reason to use Windows is if you really want to play the games... Or if there's some proprietary program you really need to use that has no alternative. Yeah, which really only applies if you uh, are a company. Yeah, companies are the ones that often have things in like a proprietary database, you know, and they can't get it out. And you know what? Honestly, if you really need something to run, most Windows programs, you can run them in Linux. You'll have to learn how to use Wine, which is actually not that easy because windows is weird and wine is a wine is a weird implementation of that weird interface yeah this is a little mini rant that's kind of related to that but there's a difference people don't often see it between easy to learn and easy to use like linux is not easy to learn if you know if you only know windows and because you already know windows windows is easy to learn yeah we're not going to pretend it's easy to learn i mean we'll we'll do a whole show sometime and we really will on linux and what it is and why it's different yeah. and why i mean if you only if you only use Windows and you figure out that the Firefox is the big blue E, then you'll be able to browse the web in Linux like nothing. If someone else sets up Ubuntu or something for you, you know that's that's not the hard part. But really, you know, being able to use your computer like you use your Windows computer is going to take learning. But the difference is is that Linux is easy to use, and that once you know it, it's a snap. Because once you learn how to fix a certain problem, one you'll fix it and you'll never have that problem again. Yep. And it's also, think the best example people give is VI. VI is hella hard to l- learn. I mean, the commands for VI are like, push ran- seemingly random keys on the keyboard to make things happen. Yes, I, I've, I actually have witnessed hilarity, especially at RIT and at my job, where someone starts VI to type something, and they try to type, and it won't type, and then they can't make the program stop. They yep. can't get out. I mean, escape colon WQ is how you save and quit. Yeah, VI is a text you can editor. Also do... It's a text editor. I don't know if we said that, and you might not know. Yeah, but anyway, the point is is that you'll never learn. In order to learn VI, you have to read books and practice and get used to it over many, many moons. And this isn't being condescending. We had to learn it and read books. The same yeah, I'm still not the master, and I use it every day. Yeah. But the thing is is that once you learn it, think about this. In, Wind, in Microsoft Word, if you want to delete five lines of text, right, you have to click drag and select very precisely those five lines of text and hit backspace. That's easy to learn, but that takes a little while. In VI, I press D5D. That's the easiest thing in the world, delete five lines of text. I yep. push three keys, did it, and they're gone immediately. That's real easy to do. But to learn that, you have to learn something. And that's what Linux is about. Yep. And, and we're that's not what saying, building a computer is about, We're not too. saying one is better than the other. There's just two different approaches. Are you will, mm-hmm. Do you not want to learn? And then that's fine, and it's really easy to learn how to do new, new things, but you won't be able to do them quickly or optimally. Yep. Or are you going to spend all that time and effort, and it's not that easy sometimes, and then you'll be able to do things quickly and optimally. Mm-hmm. And that's what building a computer is all about, is that you have to learn something to build your own computer. But in the end... Everything will be awesome for you once it's built. You'll save a pile of money, and your computer will be all slick, and you won't have crashes and viruses, and who knows? It'll just be great. But if you get a Dell, you don't have to learn anything, but it's not going to be so great later, and it might not be the easiest to use. 
Now, we just realized, as we've been talking for pretty much as long as we wanted to talk in one show, that there's a lot more to this topic than we can cover yep, in like, one show. Like, which parts to select and such. So this is now going to be a continuing series until we finish. Every Monday, until we complete this series, we are going to go through all the steps and all the components of building a computer. You know, I, I'm actually kind of pleased because, you know, we kind of shied away from the tech science because it was informative on Monday, but I think we uh, we did pretty good with informative. I think it helps that we did informative that we're also knowledgeable about. Mm, That's and key. excited to teach people about. Yeah, I mean, you heard me floundering earlier when I was trying to explain that uh, biology article because as much as I love that stuff, I'm not well-versed in the hard sciences anymore. Yeah, I had that great, you know, fifth-grade bio description of how a virus works. Yeah, I have the slightly better, like, AP biology from high school definition. Well, I took honors biology in high school, but it was mostly molecular biology, and it wasn't so much the viruses and the bacteria as it was the DNAs and the anatomies and things. I bred fruit flies until they had mutations, and then I cataloged them. Yeah, we, uh... You know what? Did Fruit flies else. all look the same, and I didn't find shit. Awesome. <laughs> totally awesome. All right. We out. And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Thanks for listening. Please remember to point your favorite podcatcher at feeds.feedburner.com slash geeknights to get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Also, please visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com for the latest updates and forum discussions. And whether you love or hate our podcast, we won't know unless you send your feedback to us at geeknights at gmail.com.